So, Pravina, this is a complete pleasure to have a conversation with you in the context of GFF, but also on a topic that I think you are uniquely well positioned um, to talk about and give us uh, give us and the industry a lot of insight. You know, we have uh, our Global FinTech Fest, which is around the corner, around August 28th, 29th, not those many days uh, away. And we have this really fascinating topic, which uh, all of you on the advisory board and we created around the future of finance as a topic that this year's GFF is going to focus on. And if you are going to talk about future of finance, the digital public infrastructure, DPI, has to be a central part of that discussion. It has made such a seminal difference to the financial services market structure in India and in other parts of the world that talking more about it and exploring what the state of the art is and where it is headed is quite critical for us to even talk about the future of finance. So that's the context. And um, I really look forward to having a fantastic discussion, exploring different facets of this topic with you. Um, so before we dive in, let me let me kick this off with an interesting question and I'd love to get your perspective. Pravina, you have seen DPI from really close quarters. In fact, you have been one of the core members who shaped uh, this in India in, uh, in a material form. What do you think is the current state of the art? What does DPI look like in India? And then if you can talk a little bit also in other parts of the world. Hey, Yash, so great to be there on this conversation, uh, kicking off some of our uh, GFF content here. Uh, and I want to actually set the stage a little bit by by talking about the impact that you know digital is having uh, around the world. When we look at the global space around financial institutions, financial services, you know BFSI as we call them, and in fact one of the BCG reports um, outlines uh, a revenue potential number in the tune of about twenty one trillion dollars by twenty thirty. That practically says you know fifty percent from where we stand today in about seven years time. Um, and where is that gonna come from, right? That's gonna come from, of course, to some extent, um, growing economies, um, growing uh, you know, population, at least in some parts of the world, but more importantly, from the increasing depth and coverage of financial services, which is more people coming into the, uh, into the uh, fray, as well as, um, users, consumers, corporates being able to utilize a wider, broader, and more holistic range of financial services. This entire space um, is being driven by technology when it comes to growth, mm -hmm. right? When we say fintech, that's what we mean. It means technology in finance, and it is driving it in both ways. One, it could be powering um, finance from within, or it is getting right. powered by finance, which means wow. that there are banks or financial institutions that are supporting fintechs that they're on offer certain services. Um, and, and that's really where this starts getting very exciting because this is again being driven by technology and you know the entire space of uh, movement that we are seeing there. But how are these pieces coming together? How is the supply side and demand side coming together? Um, how are financial institutions and you know fintechs coming together? And I think that's really the world of what you're calling DPI. So DPI, you know, digital public infrastructure. But I think the key words here are digital infrastructure. Um, and you know, let's take infrastructure first, right? Mm -hmm. So when we take infrastructure, at the core is the fact that it is standard. It hmm. is standard. Now, in this case, it is a standard protocol or a standard specification, uh, something that also determines a minimum user experience. Right. And then you have interoperable. And interoperable is a magic word here because interoperable hmm. implies that there is a platform at play. And the platform at play then creates access to everybody. It um, opens up the entire um, interface to a large player, small player, large bank, small bank, you know, uh, different fintechs playing different kind of roles as they uh, deem required. Um, the third thing would really be population scale, right? Because when we're talking infrastructure, it's mm -hmm. not a 
it's not a small scale activity if it's at a country level it's got to support every citizen of the country and if it goes beyond the country then it needs to support um, you know whatever is the jurisdictions it it covers so it is population scale at that level hmm. and the second keyword here is digital and digital really is an instant experience hmm. Um, hmm. having an instant experience and having an instant experience in a very holistic end to end manner so it doesn't mean that a user is able to just perform you know one piece of their their transaction instantly but they are able to on board themselves onto a financial service they are able to perform a transaction activity they are able to fulfill their um their needs if there is a post transaction sort of an experience required so really it is holistic and i think right. that's where taking the indian example there is there is the foundation element of identity with aadhaar and um, you know the whole service of uh, kyc that is driven by by aadhaar uh there is upi you know and i can talk for upi for a long time but i'll try to keep that brief <laughs> um so upi really is to say how this customer experience has been powered up uh, mm. by unbundling the store of value and the experience itself so the customer can yeah. use yeah. You know, their bank account of choice the bank provides the control compliances while the customer then can choose their app of their choice it could be the bank it could be any other uh, fintech app and then they get the best of both worlds that they are looking for and same to do with a merchant or a corporate uh, i think the nuanced points that you are making around um uh, standardization a holistic experience uh, a platform which allows some democratization of access to these these features um and the demand side being ready and and this getting served by the supply side of dpi i, I find that really fascinating and i just wanted to probe a bit deeper on this um this notion of unbundling that you spoke about in upi i think whenever i am seeing globally um standard protocols standard infrastructure or just standards getting created this unbundling is an inherent attribute of that that process because once you can unpack a journey or a end to end financial interaction or any kind of interaction health uh, or 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 uh, or logistics or or agriculture it is then possible to create standards uh, identity will have a standard um, transaction will have a standard um, a complaint uh, will have a standard a query will have a standard and so on and so forth so i are you as you have thought about this and you have you have seen upi very closely but if we can use that experience to talk a bit more broadly about other infrastructures getting created as well how is this process of standardization really playing out and do you think these standards are so standard that they can go global or does it require a lot of customization as you go from india to other parts of the world i think that's a great question right uh, because standards have been rightfully deployed in india way beyond just payments and identity um into commerce with ondc um into the account aggregation framework which is to do with you know having consent based architecture for access of data yeah. um and we see many examples of this happening at a country level in payments Correct. itself we have you know pay now in singapore you know prom pay in thailand and you know many other uh, fast payment, payment. yeah fast payment infrastructure and slowly we are starting to see this interconnectedness coming in however a global standard as a single mm. standard does not exist but i think mm. we are starting to see the green shoots of standards around how this uh, if i may use that word you know intra country uh, interoperability can take place so and how far are we savina from that uh, from interoperability uh, Is so it, i think we've seen the early pilots you know there is a and i won't even call it a pilot because uh, these corridors like uh, singapore and thailand are live you know singapore upi in india as well as um, you know the singapore uh, fast pay is uh, interconnected transactions are actually taking place as we speak and uh, bi is recently in fact uh, you know has announced uh, more uh, more standards around how this interconnectedness can take place And, but it's early days there and i think we have to see more of these bilaterals come into play a uh, slowly starting to right. become you know multilateral starting to become small networks 
and then we really have right. a, a, a network of network effect. So I think it may not be one global standard, but mm. global standards starting to uh, to get interconnected with each other. You know, uh, UPI also is an example of how some of these uh, elements which have gotten very successful in India are now starting to have a certain demand on the global stage. So with uh, right. there's a lift and shift of, you know, let's say the UPI, a protocol and standard technology in other markets, then connecting them up starts becoming even simpler there. Correct. And I think this is something that uh, the rest of the world uh, is really benefiting from what they're observing in, uh, in certainly India, but also other emerging economies. This, uh, this innovation at population scale, again, something that you alluded to earlier, getting built on the back of national efforts rather than smaller private enterprises with limited funding trying to hack their way through this. So A, I think it gives um, the ability to scale faster. Uh, and there's one other point that you mentioned right up front, which I thought was uh, was actually very deep, uh, is that there is it builds trust. Without that, there is no adoption. And how do you get people to say, hey, I'm okay using this QR code, which is just printed on a sticker and uh, you know put at a merchant shop. Uh, I'm I'm willing to transfer my real hard-earned money through that. So the ability to build trust around it is so crucial to doing this. And then making sure that cross-border we can take it is quite powerful. I think there's a whole bunch of lessons that we spoke about here, Praveena. Now, let me try and add the next layer to this, which is in the context of this DPI, whether it is national or transnational, if we think about the role of fintechs who are trying to do innovation on top of this or build around it, uh, and I think you, you said something again very interesting, which is in some cases it is finance which is powering the, the fintech uh, and in some cases, or the tech, and in some cases it's really the tech which is making finance more efficient. But if, if you take the two-way street, how do incumbents, fintechs, in the context of DPI, think about building businesses and doing innovation. What are you seeing as success factors and what are some of the pitfalls people might want to avoid? Just your perspective on this. No, that's, a, that's a great question. And uh, I think if we look at the entire uh, continuum there, you know, uh, the word digitally native um, yeah. uh, institution or organization is now increasingly used, right? Uh, digitally native broker, digitally native bank, you know, called a new bank or a digital bank, etc., which means that an organization that had no history of doing traditional uh, banking or doing, you know, having traditional security services, really getting into the space with a digital first thinking, a digital first design mindset, customer experience, and so on and so forth. So that's clearly one of the spectrum. And uh, to a large extent, I think this is the group that writes the rules and disrupts and creates the new experiences that um, early adopters, you know, start experimenting with. This but still, a yes. large part of our, uh, our business, the large part of uh, banking and financial services uh, rests in a world which combines the best of both. So there mm. is that trust, security, confidence, control, compliance, etc. that comes from the, uh, the traditional players. And um, a number of such players are also establishing uh, digitally driven businesses. And, you know, again, there are you know, many examples of this. So if, for example, if you take um, uh, Starling Bank in, in UK as, you know, a digitally native example, I think uh, a PayMe or a Zing from HSBC, et cetera, would be examples of really uh, a traditional institution, large institution establishing, you know, and sort of ring fencing a different business line which operates yeah. very digitally. And I think these are ways to really, um, you know, take back space in some way, right? Uh, that perhaps the digitally native organizations have started eating into from the early adoption stage onwards. And then of course, the whole continuum of how technology is driving uh, services, which it, which it has now for many decades. So nothing new about that, um, but clearly the time for an overhaul uh, has come mm. and it's no longer about banking and financial institutions being driven by technology, but the customer experience being digitally driven um, right. in a holistic manner. Right. So I think, in fact, we have enough examples in, in, 
in India and other markets as we as we speak, where entire core banking systems are being rehauled and uh, and upgraded okay. to meet these requirements. So I think the whole gamut is is uh, you know very visible, and uh, we will see a lot more traditional players, you know, with very innovative offerings, deploying latest technology. Um, you know, looking at how data can be utilized towards offering services, leveraging AI, um, starting to look at early phases of, uh, you know, quantum computing in terms of uh, the next uh, generation of services here. So the fact that there is part of the digital uh, feature set, which is available as a public infrastructure, that should allow even incumbents to build what you called as digitally driven businesses, even if they are not natives. It should allow them to build digitally driven businesses with lower risk um, and uh, faster, right? Um, are you seeing are you seeing incumbents do that enough? Um, what, where do you think we are in that? How would you rate? India as an ecosystem uh, on on just building digitally driven businesses. I think digital native. There's a whole bunch of innovation that um, that's happening. Uh, but on the second part, where do you think uh, we lie? You know, I think very much globally as well as in India, the existing the, the traditional large institutions are certainly creating um, business lines which are very digitally driven, and they are looking to looking at their technology, looking at overhauling their technology, you know, deploying the latest in whatever is available uh, to really create these new experiences. And interestingly, um, in India, you know, we've got the DPDP Act now, which is the, yeah. the digital, uh, you know, data protection bill coming into force, which uh, is on the lines of what we've seen globally with GDPR and so on and so forth. And to some extent, this puts the power back in the hands of the of the consumer. So yeah. I think it, it really creates now the next generation of level playing field, if I may, you know, put it that way, where the consumer has has a choice. Um, right. It's no longer about, hey, you know, uh, who has my data and who's deploying my data in whatever form they deem fit. And in some ways, you know, traditional license regulated, highly regulated financial institutions might have had their hands more tied in how mm. they've been able to compete in that space with organizations that may, may not have had some of those uh, restrictions. But with yeah. the consumer now saying, hey, this is what I want to do with, with my data, and this is how I want to use it, deploy it, you know, uh, give you access, not give you access, it actually resets the framework all over again. Yeah. I think and you just so see the next, next sort of generation of, um, of innovation being driven by this. I'm, I'm completely in that camp because in the last almost one and a half to two years, I have been in so many discussions, Praveena, where uh, the, the, the boards have been debating whether there are, they are givers or takers of data. And those who perceive themselves as givers of data always have a little bit of risk aversion that they are losing money that they are gaining. And those that are takers of data... Uh, are always crying about level playing field and 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 so on, right? But if you just pivot that entire discussion and say the data belongs to the consumer, that that just changes the discussion. And now, if the consumer wants their data to be shared from point A to point B for rendering a certain service or access, accessing a service, uh, that needs to kind of just happen. And I must say, I I see this now. I've studied this closely in different parts of the world. On this. Uh, it's quite unique because there are three paradigms. There's a paradigm in the Western world where the data is owned by the institution. There's a paradigm in the European ecosystem where the data is owned by the regulator or the governing authorities. And then there's a data in the emerging economy where the uh, or paradigm in the emerging economy where the data is owned by the customer or the consumer. And I think this, um, uh, again, I think this is a place where it, this approach is extremely synergistic with DPI. It is extremely synergistic with, with innovation. And to be honest, it's very uh, synergistic with incumbents just coming up the curve faster and being alert to, uh, to all of this. Revenues from data become a thick line item in the PNL of financial institutions. I must not miss this opportunity to get 
get you to reflect on it because i know that you are sitting there and thinking day in and day out about the direction in which you're going to take at least parts of dpi and india and you're seeing this in all other parts of the world as well quite actively so from your unique um, vantage point pravina what's the future of dpi where are we going and different parts of the world is it going to be different or is it broad consensus on how this is going to evolve um i think the opportunity always lies where uh, we still have under penetration mm yeah because where penetration is there there is a certain inertia towards change but right. large swaths of the world um large swaths of the population many segments within financial services still meet this criteria so there's there's enough and more opportunity and there's enough and more to be done and if we come back within india i think um if we just look at the health stack and here what um, irda has as a vision by 20 2045 they really want every indian to have insurance uh which is not the case today it's deeply under penetrated so that's a great vision and once the regulator sort of sets it up and you know once the policy um makers are driven by it then it's for the rest of the institutions to rally around it and create the right framework and create the platform and so on and so forth right, right. we're seeing the same thing you know when it comes to to investments um it's going to go beyond financial institutions you know you spoke of the education stack and the health stack and so basically if you if you take this as a as sort of the playbook and you know drive the playbook sector by sector it's um, you know ready and and open to happen yeah. and i think this is really what is very exciting for me uh, that this is what uh, gff should do for us it gives us the platform uh, to really have these conversations uh looking forward to central bankers regulators uh from around the world coming in uh we're looking to banks financial institutions fintechs so really it's going to be a, a potpourri of sorts uh, where each one of these pieces of the conversation we had today and and a lot more uh, is going to get uh, discussed in uh, threadbare detail and and the theme of uh, the global fintech festival itself is very interesting so a it moves beyond fintech right so it's clearly the next decade blueprint for the next decade of finance so finance is really you know we started off talking about that whole 360 degree piece when it comes to finance and the the fin- institutions that drive it and of course fintech being a component of that um the next decade i think has all these possibilities and opportunities um, and really you know who knows we can never really write the future so we can only uh, have a vision for it and uh, create this blueprint uh, we had what 60000 or the people coming in uh, on a per day yeah. basis last year i think we're looking at a similar number this year 100 plus speakers from number of countries around the world so really very excited and uh, waiting to uh, to meet you and everybody else there like was proven this is going to be an amazing melting pot and i look forward to continuing this conversation with you as well at gff thank you so much for taking the time uh, we barely scratched the surface uh, but it's a great discussion and see you soon bye bye